What's going on guys, this is Rob. Uh, if you guys enjoy my content, make sure you hit the subscribe button and make sure you hit that little bell so you never miss out on my sexy voice. Okay, what is going on guys? This is Rob, and I'm sure you guys are excited about the Black Panther movie that's coming out, at least I know I am, and I have no idea when I'm releasing this video, probably this weekend, uh, but I am really excited about the whole Black Panther film. And so I had my writer, Ryan, the same guy who wrote the script on Omega Level, Beyond Omega Level, Pickle Rick, I had him write up a script on Wakanda Explained. The problem is that Ryan has been derelict in his duties, and he has not written up anything about the Dora Milashe. So now I've got to explain the Dora Milashe off the top of my head, which is kind of a problem. But anyway, so the Dora Milashe in, in Marvel Comics, they exist in two forms. There is the way they used to exist, and then there's the way they exist now. So the way it used to be in Wakanda is not every tribe felt like they were receiving like adequate representation when it came to how they were viewed by the Black Panther at the time, the, the sitting king of Wakanda. And so there was some measure of like civil discourse. It wasn't like very many tribes had the gumption to like openly revolt against the sitting king, but there would be things where they would, they would promote like small little rebellions here and there, or at least there was fear of open rebellion. And so what ended up happening is one of the Black Panthers, I don't remember which, but one of the Black Panthers basically christened or created something called the Dora Malashe. And what would happen is that each one of these tribes in Wakanda would put forward their most beautiful daughter, uh, potentially to become the wife of Black Panther. The problem with this is that they would serve in a couple capacities. If one of the Dora Malashe was chosen to become a wife, then the others were chosen to become bodyguards. But because no one Dora Malashe knew or no, uh, no one of these women knew if they would be a bodyguard or a wife, they were all trained to become bodyguards. Now, of course, it would serve very little purpose to have a bodyguard for Black Panther that basically gets defeated really fast. Like, that'd be kind of useless. <laughs> That'd be kind of pointless. Uh, and so what ended up happening is all the Dora Milashe were basically trained to become like these elite assassins and they are hardcore. I mean, they're like the best warriors that the, the Black Panther has at his side. Now, the idea was that with uh, one of those Dora Milashe becoming, uh, becoming the wife of the Black Panther, they would still be exceedingly good at combat because, you know, they were trained to potentially become a bodyguard. But after a while, that trend kind of died off. It eventually sort of went away and it was considered to be archaic of an older time. Now, T'Challa brought the trend back. The difference here is that he did not intend to marry anybody inside of Wakanda. In Black Panther Volume 3, there was a girl, it was, I want to say it was something Lynn or like Lindy or something along those lines. Uh, Christopher Priest wrote in a character that Black Panther uh, proposed to, but she was an outsider. She was not part of Wakandan heritage. And so in order to basically appease all these different tribes that felt like they were being left out, he reinstated the whole idea of the Dora Milashe. But he ultimately ended up viewing them as like daughters as opposed to potential wives. And this kind of segued into him marrying Storm, who was from Africa, but not actually from Wakanda. She was from the Serengeti. And so the result was that uh, the Dora Milashe basically were just kind of maintained as bodyguards as opposed to potential wives. But it did serve its purpose because the various tribes felt like they were being adequately represented in the Wakanda royal family as opposed to just kind of being left out. And so that's basically the nature of how the Dora Milashe came into existence and what they're capable of. Now, on to Wakanda itself. So Wakanda is a country in northeastern Africa and is borderline by Ethiopia and Uganda and Kenya and Somalia <laughs> and the fictional nation of Nairobi. Now, in terms of its real life origin, Wakanda was created by Stan Lee and Jack Kirby and first appeared in Fantastic Four number 52 in 1966. However, what we do know about Wakanda's history within the Marvel Universe goes back much, much farther to a man named Bashinga, who was the first king to rule over Wakanda and the first person to become Black Panther, all of which happened around 10,000 years ago. Now, as a side note here, I think it's important to explain that while the Black Panther is the name by which T'Challa uses when he operates as a superhero, it's actually a ceremonial title given to the chief of the Panther cult, which we'll dive into in more detail here in a second. But without a doubt, the most significant event to ever happen to the, to the country of Wakanda was a meteorite crashing and bringing with it a vast deposit of vibranium to Wakanda itself. And so vibranium, for those of you guys who don't know, is one of the strongest and hardest metals in the Marvel Universe and is able to absorb all sound waves and vibrations as well as amplify magical energy. Now, predictably, these properties make vibranium a highly sought after commodity within the Marvel Universe. Now, the deposit of vibranium in Wakanda was first discovered by Bashinga, who subsequently sealed it off because some of the people who discovered it along with him were exposed to the radiation and they became what Bashinga referred to as like demon spirits that basically turned on other Wakandans. Now over the course of the next several centuries, vibranium would effectively become the lifeblood that sustained the Wakandan economy. King T'Chaka, who was the father of T'Challa, actually sold off small quantities of vibranium and used the money to fund education for his citizens as well as the technological advancement of Wakanda itself. But after T'Chaka died, T'Challa took over, became the new Black Panther, and actually ended ended his father's policy of isolation from the rest of the world and began selling larger quantities of vibranium to buyers that he was sure would not use
use it for nefarious purposes. Now, because of all the money that Wakanda made from the sale of their vibranium over the years, they've developed into one of the most technologically advanced countries in the world and the richest country in the world. To give you guys some uh, some some uh, some perspective here, vibranium sells for about ten thousand dollars a gram. Now, if there's around ten thousand to uh, tons of vibranium in Wakanda, then we could say about two thousand pounds per ton. So that's about twenty million tons or twenty million pounds roughly. And then you multiply that times uh, four hundred fifty-three. That's nine billion something. And then multiply each one of those by ten thousand ten thousand dollars. So that comes. I would say it comes out to be something like ninety trillion dollars or something. It comes out to be an insane amount of money. Like it's ridiculous. Uh, assuming that's right. Assuming my math is right, then that would mean that Wakanda's value is higher than the rest of the world's gross domestic product, which is to say the value of all the goods and services any one particular country can offer. I would say, as it stands right now, at least last I read in 2016, the GDP of the world was like $75 trillion, which means that if this is true, Wakanda's GDP is worth $15 trillion more than the rest of the world combined, which is pretty bonkers when you think about it. But regardless of the scenario, there are a tons of examples of Wakanda technology using vibranium throughout the entirety of Wakanda itself. For example, there is a jungle that Blankus Wakanda that was engineered by T'Challa and actually sort of blends in vibranium seamlessly with the jungle itself. So it's actually pretty cool. There are aircraft powered by magnets called magnetic wave riders that are capable of transcontinental travel within Wakanda itself. And Wakanda's also developed devices known as holopods, which create holographic duplicates of their users. Now, there is also a great deal more technology in Wakanda that goes on as well, but most of that's confined to Black Panther's own suit, which we'll actually cover in a video later on. But the most interesting thing about Wakanda is that on one hand, you have this super advanced and super wealthy country in the middle of Africa, which sets it apart from the rest of the continent. But on the other hand, the people of Wakanda still follow extremely faithfully the tribal religions of their ancestors. So for that reason, I think in order to fully understand Wakanda itself, we're going to have to go and have a discussion on some of the major religious groups that are present there, which are referred to in comics as cults, but really you could call them clans if you wanted to. So the basis of the Wakandan religion is actually pretty interesting as it dates back to Stan Lee's work with Marvel's predecessor Atlas Comics in 1950. Now in issue number 96 of the series Marvel Tales, Stan Lee created a pantheon of gods known as the Heliopolitans, which are based on the deities of ancient Egypt. Now 16 years later, Stan Lee would introduce one of these deities known as Bast, the Panther God, and those who worship Bast make up the Panther Cult, which traces itself all the way back to Bashinga himself. Himself. Now, the Panther cult persists as the most widely followed and official state religion even today, some 10,000 years after it was originally founded. Now, when a Black Panther dies, a new one has to be crowned. You cannot have a vacant throne in Wakanda. A new Black Panther has to be chosen. And while this is a hereditary title, the one assuming the role must prove themselves worthy, simply meaning that it's not like a monarchy. It's not like a Black Panther dies and a new one just ascends to the throne. You have to prove yourself worthy. And to do this, you have to be invited to take part in the eating of something that's called the heart-shaped herb. Now, the heart-shaped herb is a plant that's native to Wakanda and is thought to be, or at least was thought to be a gift from Bast to the various followers of the Panther cult but in reality, this isn't true. It's basically a plant that was just irradiated by vibranium radiation. That's really all it is. But the herb does, uh, does give its user extraordinary strength and agility. Now, after eating the herb, the aspiring Black Panther has to defeat six of Wakanda's best warriors in combat all at the same time in order to prove themselves worthy. Now, this is, of course, assuming a Black Panther has died. If a person chooses to challenge a Black Panther, they have to consume the heart-shaped herb, then they have to fight the Black Panther, then they have to defeat six of his best warriors all at the same time. And the, the caveat to all this is that if the heart-shaped herb rejects you, then you'll die. But although the Black Panther cult is the dominant religion in Wakanda, it's not the only one. Other cults also exist or have existed at some point in time that are sworn to serve the other Heliopolitan deities. For example, there is the defunct crocodile cult that once worshipped the crocodile god Sobek. But this faction has been wiped, well at least it was wiped out, after they resurrected the villain Morlun in hopes of overthrowing the Black Panther. And then Morlun basically turned on all of them and killed them all immediately after coming back to life. For those of you guys who don't know who Morlun is, Marvel Comics established that there are what are called totems, beings that represent uh, animals, more or less. And Morlun is an inheritor. What this means is that if a person draws their power from an animal, Morlun can consume that person's life energy and sustain himself. Another minor cult is the Lion Cult, which worships the goddess Sekhmet. But basically, all we know about this cult is that it was once a lot more popular than the Panther Cult in Wakanda, but almost all the followers of the Lion Cult defected and joined the Panther Cult. But finally, Finally, there is probably the most significant 
cult that exists outside of the Panther cult, which is the White Gorilla Cult, which worship the gorilla god Gurk. At least I think that's how you pronounce it, is Gurk. But once the Panther cult rose to prominence, the worship of this god, the, the White Gorilla God, was outlawed in its entirety. But some followers still practiced their faith in areas of Wakanda, the most notable of which was called Jabari Village, which was ruled over by a man that was only known as the White Gorilla. Now, White Gorilla actually hated Black Panther, uh, largely because Black Panther wouldn't share his wealth with the other tribes in Wakanda, with these other cults. And so as a result, during World War II, White Gorilla actually formed an alliance with family-friendly term for the German military group led by a dictator, and in turn, led an entire attack on Wakanda itself. Now, of course, he was ultimately defeated alongside the efforts of Captain America because, you know, I mean, it's World War II and Captain America and, you know, so on and so forth. But the White Gorilla cult did not actually die with its leader and would actually reemerge under the leadership of a guy named M'Baku. M'Baku was basically the greatest, or at least the second greatest warrior in uh, in Wakanda, uh, second to T'Challa, and would actually appear, or at least will actually appear in the Black Panther movie, as well as Avengers Infinity War, which suggests that Wakanda is going to play a huge role in this phase of the Marvel Cinematic Universe. But while T'Challa was gone from Wakanda for an extended sabbatical, M'Baku, calling himself Manape, a nickname that I can almost guarantee they won't use in the Marvel Cinematic Universe for a variety of reasons, actually revives the White Gorilla Cult and then claims the throne of Wakanda for himself. Now, to help him accomplish this, uh, M'Baku kills one of the rare white gorillas living in the Wakanda jungle and then, as, as weird as this sounds, bathes in its blood and then eats his flesh, which gives him the gorilla's strength. And so ultimately, as you may have guessed, M'Baku was beaten by Black Panther and exiled from Wakanda. Something that I do want to point out here, most likely what will happen with Manape, I have no doubt that Eric Killmonger will most likely be killed in uh, Black Panther, uh, the movie, which kind of sucks because I really hope that doesn't happen. I think that Eric Killmonger is actually a far more interesting villain than Manape is. Most likely what will happen here, if M'Baku, if Manape is supposed to appear in Infinity War, what will likely take place is Black Panther will have to leave Wakanda in order to partake in the Infinity War battle. When that happens, Manape will most likely make his move and take over Wakanda in T'Challa's absence so that T'Challa will come back and have to deal with regaining his country in the midst of a, of a revolution. That's most likely what will happen. I don't see any reason why anything other than that would happen. But yeah, that's pretty much a, a coverage on all the major stuff of Wakanda. There's small little tidbits here and there. And we'll talk about stuff like Black Panther's uh, suit, things like that. We'll talk about that in a later video. But if you guys are new here to Comments Explained, make sure you guys hit the sub button to become part of the Rob Corps. If you guys enjoy this video, make sure you drop a like and I will catch you all later. Peace.